Hello and welcome back to the Sharks world. We're finally back to my traditional format videos and discussion based topics. Today we're going to be going over an article done by Scientific Reports in which they did a social networking analysis on sharks. More specifically, they conducted it on a species of shark that most people wouldn't expect to be as social or as intelligent as the public would believe. The species in question for today's video is the sand tiger shark. Now, the behaviors discussed in this article are behaviors that historically have been associated with higher order mammals. A brief side note on this topic is I personally would consider sharks to be higher order fish, but that is a rant for another day. This goes to a point that I've made in previous videos about the comparison between mammals and other animals. Whereas intelligence is generally associated with mammals, but not other animals, especially not sharks. Now, as I've also said in those videos, this is not malicious. However, it's just a case of other animals being far smarter than people would care to imagine or admit. Before we get too deep in this article, there are a few caveats that I would like to make. 1. They say at the beginning of the article that studying the social networking behavior of any marine species is difficult, as what we usually see on the surface and or videos is but a mere fraction of the animal in question's life. 2. The main behaviors that we're going to be covering in this article are fission behaviors, fusion behaviors, and the benefits that both of these strategies provide, as well as the difficulties. The subcategories of these behaviors are summering, south migration, community bottleneck, dispersal, and north migration. And finally, while I am going to be going into great detail of this article, like my great white shark versus humpback whale video, I would still highly recommend that you give the main source article a read. It's very, very interesting and highlights some things that I will not cover in this video. I will leave a link to this article in the description below, please yourself a favor and give it a good read. And with that intro out of the way, as always ladies and gentlemen, grab you a Celsius, have a seat at the table, and let's take a closer look at shark social networking. More specifically, that of the sand tiger shark. The way this experiment was conducted is scientists tagged two sand tiger sharks who in this article will be identified as ST1 and ST2. They left these tags on the sharks for about a year before they recovered them. These tags tracked and highlighted where the sharks spent a lot of their time. What I find particularly interesting is that these tags were able to record some other sharks that the sand tigers encountered, including lemon sharks, bull sharks, and one of them at one point even encountered a great white. Both ST1 and ST2 were considered mature males at the time of tagging. The areas that they really hung around in were up the east coast of North America, mainly hanging around Virginia and North Carolina, with one of them touching base briefly in South Carolina. The devices used to tag the sharks were called Vimco Mobile Transceivers, of which they and I will be referring to them as VMTs for the remainder of this video. Briefly touching on a point that I brought up earlier, these scientists use VMTs to tag not only sand tiger sharks, but other animals in the area, and that's part of the way they were able to tell what type of other animals they encountered, the lemon sharks, the great whites, and other animals with VMTs as well. 
I suppose I should also specify that two animals with VMTs encountering each other just means that they came within a few hundred meters of one another. These encounters were recorded as detections, and the VMTs were able to keep track of exactly how many detections the sharks had. What they found, and this is the part as to where it shows just how social these sand tigers were being, is the amount of detections that ST1 and ST2 had were 52% and 61% respectively with other sand tiger sharks. To put that in simple terms, both ST1 and ST2 for the time that they were recorded spent over half of their lives around other sand tiger sharks. Now, I know, some of you might be thinking, shark does. How is this interesting? Plenty of animals spend half their lives around other members of its own species. A good number of animals do it for even longer. The interesting thing about this is the types of behaviors that were displayed during these encounters. More specifically, the two behaviors that I named earlier, fission and fusion behaviors. This is the part of the video where I would recommend you pause the video here and here so that you can see the definitions of fission and fusion behavior so you have an idea of what I'm talking about when we go into the five subcategories of these recordings. The first behavioral subcategory that we'll be going over is summary. In the month of September that the experiment took place, both ST1 and ST2 were recorded summering in the Delaware Bay and the surrounding coastal waters. What summering is, is not just high group population, but high group diversity. Males, females, lots of different ages and different social statuses, etc. One of the biggest reasonings and benefits to summering is reduced food competition due to a high abundance of food and resources. This behavior has also been noticed in primates as well. The scientists noted strong network overlap between ST1 and ST2 with a high encounter rate of other individual sand tiger sharks. I'd like to pause here for a moment to discuss another reason as to why it's very beneficial for you to read the article itself, as it has graphs that not only shows the encounters between ST1 and ST2 when it comes to not just sand tiger sharks, but other species of animals in the ocean as well. The next behavioral subcategory that we'll be going over is South Migration. Another thing that you could call this is the Fall Migration, and it took place anywhere between October and November. What's interesting about this behavior is that ST1 and ST2 went from a very well diverse group of sand tiger sharks, different sizes, different sexes, different ages to an almost exclusively male group. The males migrated to the south, while the females migrated elsewhere. Now, they do note in the article that sexual segregation is actually rather common in Elasma bronchis, but an interesting comparison they made is when it comes to some other mammals. Elephants, dolphins, and kangaroos will often have sexual segregation for the reasoning of having sparring partners, protection against predators, and navigational knowledge. They are still trying to determine the reasoning as to why these sand tigers are doing it, which requires more study, but one thing they did note during the entire time of this segregation, both ST1 and ST2 were encountering the same male sand tiger sharks month after month, which implies that 
the entire time this migration was going on, they were hanging around the same group. The next behavioral subcategory that we'll be going over is community bottlenecking. Now, this behavior took place in December and in March. So let me paint a picture so you'll kind of better understand what this behavior looks like. If we take a brief moment to go back to summary, summary is large group population, high group diversity. Community bottleneck is a much smaller, more concentrated area with not necessarily as much diversity as summering, but there is group diversity. For a brief period, they do encounter some females, potentially for mating purposes. But what's interesting here is that this is when ST1 and ST2 encountered each other the most. But not just that, it's the diversity of other species that they encountered as well, including white sharks. This took place along the Carolina coast, and scientists suspect that the animals were attracted to things like shipwrecks and other areas with lots of food resources. Now we get into the next phase of behavioral analysis, the dispersal phase. At the end of March, in April, and in May, both ST1 and ST2 and the group that they're in experience a phase of dispersal, where the group just completely goes their own separate ways. Scientists speculate that the reasoning for this is because the benefits of living in a group no longer are worth it, so the sharks enter a solitary phase. These reasonings mainly being for the reduced competition for resources, being food, mates, habitats, etc. Now, this leads me to asking a question and presenting some food for thought for you. Do all sharks enter a solitary phase? More importantly, do all sharks have group diversities and behaviors like these sand tiger sharks? Meaning this, do sharks like hammerheads, tigers, and great whites, do they grow through phases of summering, migration, community bottlenecks, and dispersal? My reasoning for asking these questions is, sharks are often referred to as solitary predators. And for the most part, I would argue that this is mostly correct. But it also makes me wonder and go back to the point that I stated earlier, which is that what we see at the surface and what we see on videos and cameras is but a mere fraction of the animal's life. Not every animal in this experiment was tagged. So maybe during this solitary phase, maybe these sand tigers encountered other sand tigers that simply didn't have VMTs on them. The scientists also noted that these sharks did encounter a number of other shark species that did have VMTs, just not a lot of sand tiger sharks. What do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below or in the Sharks World Discord. But back to the topic at hand. The final behavioral subcategory that we'll be covering is North Migration. At the end of both ST1 and ST2's solitary phase, at the end of May, going into June, both sharks begin to head back north to the Delaware Bay to come full circle to head back into the summering phase. One thing that seems particularly odd is that ST1 and ST2 took different routes. Now, as to why they did, they're still trying to figure out but it is something that they noted. But this is when the cycle begins all over again. The sharks end back up in the Delaware Bay along with the females and the group diversity once again becomes very, very abundant. So what are your thoughts on these different subcategories of fission and fusion behaviors for sand tiger sharks? 
I'm particularly excited because of all the questions that still remain to be answered. What does the female migratory pattern look like? Does encountering a specific species or obstacle change the migratory patterns of both animals? What behaviors were ST1 and ST2 taking place? Because remember, the VMTs, all they recorded were just detection events, i.e. the sharks encountering other sharks and other animals with VMTs. Are there other and more complex behaviors that are taking place because we just can't see them because they're sharks and they live underwater? What else are we not seeing? I imagine that there are some very remarkable and interesting behaviors that are taking place. In regards to brain to body size ratios, sharks have relatively high brain to body size ratios comparable to that of quite a number of mammals. Sand tiger sharks in particular have extremely high brain to body size ratios for sharks. I'm talking about up there with makos, great whites, and hammerheads. This article and these behaviors serve as more proof of just how smart I believe these sharks are, and how smart more behaviors could show them to potentially be. But this is going to be where we end the video for now. I would like to take this opportunity to once again invite you to the Sharks World Discord and to check out some of my other content. Thank you once again for giving me some of your time, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then.